In this episode of In the Trenches with Dave Lapham, presented by First Star Logistics, we visit with Doug Flynn. You know, they label him a utility infielder. Man, he's so much more than that. He was he was a real part of the backbone of the Big Red Machine in 75 and 76. In my mind, as good a baseball team has ever been assembled. I mean, back-to-back World Series champions, just just phenomenal. And, and Doug Flynn is is so well-rounded, so versatile. He's done all kinds of things in his life, from singing with the Oak Ridge Boys <laughs> to Reds Fantasy Camps, to you name it. And um, obviously, he's a, been a bank executive at Central Bank in uh, Lexington, Kentucky for many, many years, and just one of the finest human beings you're ever going to want to meet. I'm sure you really enjoy this podcast with Doug Flynn. Welcome to our luxurious First Star Logistics Studios. This is In the Trenches with Dave Lapham and special guest today, the Renaissance man, Doug Flynn, a man of many, many talents. I'm telling you, you've had a heck of a life, my man. I have been blessed, and that's probably because I'm so me- mediocre at everything that I had to pick a bunch of stuff to try to do. So <laughs> I'll tell you, it, it is it is incredible. Let's get let's get into the life of uh, of Doug Flynn. Uh, born in Lexington, Kentucky, Bryant Station High School. You starred in baseball, basketball, and football. You played quarterback on a 12-1 and football team. And when you went to Kentucky, it was a combination basketball and baseball scholarship when you went to UK. I, I, stud athlete, my man. True stud. I probably have the most overrated bio of anybody you've ever met. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I, I was that guy that – you know, I couldn't carry a team, but I was the point guard who could get you in the offense. I was a quarterback who wouldn't make a mistake and could hand off to the proper people or hit a short pass. Uh, and in baseball, I wasn't going to hurt you. I could catch it. So I was so good, Lap, that when I got out of high school, I had no scholarship offers, if that tells you something. So I ended up going to Kentucky by way of playing a little basketball because they had a guard that had already signed. And... From the time he signed to go to Kentucky, he ended up getting drafted by the Cleveland Indians. And so they had an oh. opening right before the school started. That's how I got there. And then was on the baseball team, didn't get to play much. And so I ended up going down to a junior college the next year, going to the tryout camp for the Reds. And then after four tryout camps, they signed me for twenty five hundred dollars. How about that? that? Four <laughs> tryout camps. You you went with a yep. few buddies to a tryout camp, right? At Riverfront Stadium. What was that like? Yep. I mean, is that a zoo? Uh, the zoo wasn't really at Riverfront because it was well organized, but the zoo was the three before that. Uh, we went. We were on a little field, softball field down in Somerset, Kentucky for the first one. Then we wow. went to a high field for the second one. The third one was at Riverfront. The fourth one was back in Lexington. And you know what I'm thinking? These guys are filming me and they're saying, this guy is so bad, He, but we're going to keep filming him and keep leading him along so we can get some video of him. Or there was something there was intriguing. Unfortunately, that's what happened. It was something intriguing. I, I know uh, I remember Sparky Anderson talking about your glove. I mean, Sparky Anderson really respected the hands that you had. Uh, he, he said, man, this guy now, he can pick it. <laughs> well, it's a good thing because I sure couldn't hit it. That's for dead gum sure. Uh, <laughs> I, I struggled my offense pretty much all the time. I, you know, I worked hard. Uh, it just never came natural to me, but the fielding part of it was a little bit more comfortable for me. And fortunately, uh, you know, you start off with the guys I played around. I didn't have to do much my first couple of years. I just had to show up and then watch the Big Red Machine go to work. That was a lot of fun. Big Red Machine in 19, 1975 and 1976. Unbelievable baseball team. Who who was the glue of the Big Red Machine? I mean, there's so many star players, so many strong personalities. Who, who was the glue that kept it all kind of in sync? Well, I'm taking credit for it right now, as you well know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, but, that's what I've heard. Yeah. Well, and we'll get to that in a second. But I, I think probably Tony Perez, uh, because you had those big personalities in Johnny and Pete and Joe Morgan, big personalities, great players. And then you had Tony, who was the guy that everyone respected so much. He wasn't loud. Uh, he was funny when he wanted to be. He could keep the clubhouse stared up just enough to get those three guys going at each other. And then 
when they got on the field, they certainly came together in one cohesive unit. But I think probably Tony Perez was. He was he was solid as a player, solid as a person, and had the respect of every single player on the team. Was Sparky Anderson the perfect manager for that baseball team? But absolutely he was, because he's the one that was able to, you know, he started taking pitchers out. He he and Johnny both had that knack for knowing just when a pitcher was ready to come out of the ball game. And uh, he he didn't care about who you were. He came and got you whenever he thought or Johnny thought that it was time for you to come out of the game. And Sparky was also that good PR guy. You know, he was wonderful with the press. Uh, he could turn a loss into something positive and a win. He would make it sound like, and until the last year, after we started getting pretty good, uh, then Sparky was certainly our best cheerleader. And, and uh, after 75, shoot 76 was just a breeze. So let's go back to your first major league hit. You get your first major league hit off Rick Roden. Take us through that. Uh, well, it was, a, I believe, the second game of the season. And I'd already, second or third, I'd already hit once. My first at bat in the big leagues, I had to bunt. <laughs> that should have been a telltale sign of my career right there. <laughs> <laughs> but the one thing that was, I know that it's probably the biggest at bat of my career. Because if I don't get the bunt down, Sparky probably sends me to AAA. Wow. So I get, and we end up winning the game. Then the next night, Dave Concepcion, uh, I don't know, he came up with some kind of injury. So I'd already gone through all my pregame stuff, you know, all the extra guys. We went out and did our extra running. Uh, you know the drill for the guys that aren't starting. Um, and then I sat down and I was getting, you know, I was in the locker room and Pete came by me and said, hey, you're, you're playing short tonight. And I'm thinking, Dodgers, second game of the year, 50,000 people. Oh, boy. <laughs> So, and it was probably the best way. I'm glad I didn't know like the night before because I probably wouldn't have slept at all. Right. So, it, it, I was pretty comfortable because um, I played every spring training game that year trying to make the club. And the first thing is, you know, Lap, the first thing you want, all right, I, I need some contact. I need something to happen. And Davey Lopes sent me a nice two hopper about Beltai, first player, first batter of the game. And boy, after that, you know, you kind of settle in. And I, I tell you, it took a while for me really to get comfortable being in the big leagues. I mean, because all those guys that I was playing with, I've been watching them on TV for the past several years. And now sure. there you are. And, and when you're not drafted and you come out of a tryout camp and nobody knows who you are, it's a little uncomfortable for a while. But they sure made you feel comfortable in a hurry. In 1979, I mean, you, you start emerging as – one of the best defensive players, you know, in, in major league baseball, uh, second base led the league in putouts, double plays, turn third in the league in fielding percentage. Um, was it all starting to come together for you then? Yeah. And I, I was getting to play every day too. That really right. helped finding a position because, you know, in Cincinnati, I played second base, third base, shortstop. And then um, I went to New York and I started playing some short for Buddy Harrelson. Then they moved me over to third base a little bit until they got a third base when they come in. And then Felix, we had a game with the Pirates one night and somebody slid in real hard to Felix Mion and they got in a fight. And Ed Ott was a catcher with the Pirates. He was a former All-State wrestler. He picks up Felix and hammers him into the ground, breaks the bone. That moved me to second base where I was a lot more comfortable and I sort of stayed there for – mostly the rest of my career, except in 1980, when I, uh, I go to New York and I win the gold glove, uh, the very next season, 1981, Joe Torrey comes up to me in, in spring training. And he says, uh, you mind playing shortstop? Oh, wow. And I just want a gold glove at second. I figured, well, he said, we got a young phenom and I'm going to have to play him at second. So we'll play you at short. And I went, that's fine. So I played about two weeks there. The phenom didn't really develop, and then I went back to second base. <laughs> the phenom, the phenom was like uh, one of those shooting stars, <laughs> huh? It kind of faded. <laughs> but 1980, let's talk about 1980. You, you tie a major league record, three triples in a game, three triples in a game. You score after every single one of those, and then for that week, you bat 419, and you get uh, named National League uh, Player of the Week, five RBIs included with that. What do you remember about that week? You went 13 for 31 that week in three triples in one game. That that week was probably the, the, by far the best week of my career. Uh, 
I don't know. It's just, you know, in the game, sometimes you see it pretty good, and the balls you hit seem to go in, in the hole. That night in Montreal, I know the first time I got up, they were shading me to right field, and I hit a ball in the left field gap for a triple. So they kind of moved over a little bit, and I hit a ball in the right center field gap for a triple. The third time I got up, I had a – did you ever – you never played Canadian football, I don't guess, did you? So you don't know no. those fields. Well, a Riverfront might have been like this. You know the way they rolled out the football seats, and so they got a seam out there in the outfield? Yep. All right, well, they had a seam from where they played football, and I had a perfect little one-hopper, hit the seam, bounced over the left fielder's head, and I eased in for my third triple in the game. So I get up the fourth time, and Gary Carter's catching, and he says, hey, Dougie, nobody's <laughs> ever hit four triples in a game. And I went, Yeah. And he threw a fastball right down the middle. Elia Sosa did, and I hit the most perfect little one-hop double play ball you ever saw. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's uh, that's incredible. That's incredible. Um, what favorite teammates over the years? I mean, you probably have have a bunch of them. Um, you know, you played played quite a while in Major League Baseball. Anybody come roaring to mind there? Uh, probably Joel Youngblood. Uh, Joel and I played in the minors together. Then we played in Cincinnati together. We played in New York together. We played, you know, a lot of places. And uh, so we just, we were very dear friends. And, you know, Lap, when, when you're playing, the, the guys you come up with in the minor leagues, if you happen to go together or come up together or whatever, there's a special bond that you've got because you've been yep. on the bus ride with them. You've, you've gone in and, you know, you're not making any money. So you're basically just trying to get to the next level. And so uh, probably him, but from the Reds, uh, probably now Johnny Bench and I stay in touch quite often because we do a lot of stuff together. We do uh, a golf tournament here in Lexington that we, it's finally run its course. Uh, we do a military thing down at Camp Lejeune. Uh, we do one in Louisville for USA Cares. So yeah, Johnny and I have stayed in, in touch quite a bit now that he's a, you know, a, a papa, uh, he stays yeah. at home raising a fifteen-year-old and eleven-year-old. <laughs> that's uh, that, that's incredible. I mean, I I respect the heck out of that. I I can't imagine, you know, one's a teenager and one's going to be a teenager here pretty quick. Can't imagine handling that, man. Well, we tell him, we say, "What in the world were you thinking?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm telling you. So, opponents, guys, you played against. Who is a guy that was like, wow, man, this dude, this dude was really, really special? Uh, Ellis Valentine, first time I saw him play. Uh, Andre Dawson. Uh, and then when I saw Johnny behind the plate, uh, yeah. there was nobody that could touch that. Uh, Joe Morgan for a guy five foot seven was unbelievable. Uh, and then you look, you got. 4,256 hits from Pete Rose, who yeah. introduced me to my wife. Um, yeah. And uh, so it's, you know, there, there was so many good gifted players. Tom Seaver, what a gifted pitcher he was. Uh, there was a, there were a lot of guys back in the 70s that, you know, by today's standard and size, they wouldn't fit in. I mean, Johnny and Perez were considered big guys at 220. You know, right. they were, were monsters of the game back then. They were considered really big. Well, shoot, I looked at the Reds lineup one time, and when they had Jay Bruce and Joey Votto, all these guys are 6'3", 6'4", 235, and you're going, wow, wow. So, uh, but back there, they were just, you know, Tim Raines, he could run like nobody I'd ever seen before. They were just some great players. What about uh, a pitcher that uh, that you thought, oh, man, when I dig in against this guy, whew, this is going to be tough. Is there anybody that, you know, hid the ball or whatever? I remember I asked Pete Rose one time, Who's the toughest guy that you had to go to the plate against? And he threw – I can't even remember the guy's name that he threw out there because he said his his height and my height and the way he delivered the baseball, I could never pick the baseball up. It was just a just a biomechanic thing, you know, like a, a, a baseball geometry thing where I could not find the ball. Did you face any of that kind of situation? Well, he I think he was probably talking about Randy Jones because Randy Jones was a left-handed pitcher in San Diego – <clears throat> one year he lost 20 games, came back the next year, won 20 games, won the Cy Young, but he was a left-hander, but Pete used to hit off of him left-handed because he had trouble hitting off of him right-handed. Wow. 
Yet he wasn't yeah. overpowering. He just moved the ball, and there was something there. But, you know, the guys that you think that are a little nervous, uh, J.R. Richard, 6'8", 250 Ooh. pounds, who threw hard. Uh, uh, Nolan Ryan, I didn't face him much, thank goodness. But every time he throw, he grunt. And, I mean, it just – and, and then I was told before I got off of him, don't look at him. Well, where am I supposed to look? I mean, <laughs> he got turned like this and started, I don't know. <laughs> but, but, you know, there were a lot of hard throwers back in those days. Some of them didn't make it, but, you know, because they were so wild. But there were just a lot of good guys that you wondered why they didn't – they were never able to put it all together. Yeah, it's uh... – it's crazy. You mentioned your wife, Olga, former Philadelphia Eagles cheerleader. And Pete Rose uh, introduced you guys, right? Pete set you guys up? He did. It was a blind date. Uh, we were in Philly. I was with New York. I said, Pete, uh, we're going to dinner that night. And he was dating Carol at the time. I said, won't you tell Carol to bring a friend with you? Because we're going to sit there and have dinner. And he and I talk baseball and Carol would just sort of sit there. <laughs> he said, so I get on first that night and he says, I got good news and bad news. I said, what's the bad news? He said, well, the girl come tonight's engaged. And I went, Pete, I can get my own dates. That's not a problem. What's, what's... So I said, I got to hit and run on. What's the good news is I'm leaving the second base. He says, she looks good. <laughs> <laughs> Months later, we got married. And really? That's red. So 39 years. That's great. You closed the yeah. deal, Doug. You closed the deal, man. Closed the deal, baby. That's it. Yeah, it must, I don't know. What, I don't know what it was, but it was. And she's in here listening to this conversation right now. Pretty soon, she'll probably <laughs> tell me what it was. <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's stay with your family. Uh, your father, Bobby, second baseman in the Brooklyn Dodgers organization, played semi-pro ball with the Lexington Hustlers, and your mom. Your mom played second base and fast pitch softball for years. So, I mean, you get yeah. a gene pool, my man, a gene pool serious. I, I took most of my mom. My dad could hit. If, if, if I just never listened to him. But he was a good offensive player. He wasn't very big, but he was really good. Um, and he used to tell me all this, you know, what I should do and what I shouldn't do. And for whatever reason, I didn't listen to him when it came to hitting. Fielding came a lot more natural. And I used to go in the backyard and throw with my mom. Matter of fact, I was speaking one night, and I said, there's two people right here that I'd like to recognize. I said, one of them's taught me everything I know, took me out in the backyard, helped me develop. Mom, stand up. And, and I said, now the one who's taking credit for it all these years, my dad. <laughs> he didn't like that. <laughs> oh, that's great. So your dad was also a Kentucky state senator. I mean, did you ever – I could see you being a successful politician. Did you ever think about politics at all? No. No. Sir, I thought, well, that's a lie. Lab, I thought about it one time. Um, uh, they came and were trying to get me to, uh, basically, they wanted me to run for mayor, but they wanted to tell me how to run the city. And I said, I, no, I ain't playing that. So uh, I don't know. I I think at the time when I was really thinking about doing it, my I sometimes overload the things I'm thinking and it comes out of my mouth. It's probably never happened to you, I know. But it just... <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I don't think I'd last very long. I would offend somebody early, I'm afraid. So you um, spent a little time in the Mets minor league system. Did you ever think about coaching, managing that kind of maybe front office position in baseball? Did you ever think about that aspect? Absolutely, I did. When I went back into managing, um, I did it a year as a coach. And then the next year I managed and had some success. And if I had been offered the job here at Central Bank by Luther Deaton, uh, I would have I was already thinking about what's the next step, get me back to the big leagues in some capacity. Um, and then they offered me the job here at home. When they did, I called the Mets and I said, can you get in the ballpark? And well, Doug, this is the minor leagues and this is all we can do. Okay. Well, then I, I appreciate you letting me there for two years, but I'm, I'm here and going to stay at my house every night. Uh, and, and it's been just a blessing to be able to work at Central Bank. You, um, you also were involved with uh, the state of Kentucky's anti-drug campaign. That that had to be a rewarding experience for you. You know, uh, when I when I uh, came home, ball, uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, I didn't have a plan, basically. So, in every place I would go to look for work, you'd hear things like, "So, uh, what have you been doing?" Well, I played baseball. No, I mean, what'd you do for a living? Oh, okay, that's gonna work. Uh, 
okay, I'm, I got a buddy who had a car lot. He said, how about you come over here? Man, you'd be good at this. And he says, so we'll start out on Saturdays and Sundays. I went, uh, time out. I ain't working on weekends. We ain't not doing that. So that didn't work. So then the governor, Colin, started a program called Champions Against Drugs, and she was taking athletes around to talk to kids about choices. And, and uh, so I, I said, yeah, I'd love to do it. So I went around, started talking, and then they had a party one night, a derby party. And my wife and I were sitting here watching it, and we weren't invited to the derby party. I was doing all the speaking, and it said, the governor's <laughs> champions drugs people are at the derby party, and I'm going, so I called down the governor's office. I said, is there any reason why we weren't invited to the party? I'm doing all the speaking. Oh, it must have been an oversight. I said, okay, here's something that's not an oversight. I quit. <laughs> <laughs> so the governor, who was good friends of my best friend, a, a relative, so I get a call back from her chief of staff. Doug, uh, Martha wants to talk to you tomorrow morning. All right. So I go down there and talk to her. I go, first I go to meet her. She's 35 minutes late. And I'm ready to walk out. And then she walks in the room and said, did you come down here to give me a bunch of crap or what? And I said, yes, ma'am, I did. And if you don't want to hear it, you better ask me to leave right now. And then <laughs> an hour later, I walked away as executive director of the program. <laughs> okay. How about that? That's incredible. That's you mentioned uh, uh, Central Bank, locally owned independent bank, right in Lexington in your hometown. I, I bet, you know, you're, you're a legend. You're a hometown legend. And and, and working at the bank since what, 1998? What have you been doing? What what kind of things have you done at the banks over the years? Well, for the first time ever, I actually did some advertising for them. But mostly I'm a correspondent banker. So I have about 90 banks across the state that I'm in touch with. And ah. we help them with some loan participation, some credit card stuff and uh, trust services. And then, you know, just a liaison to those banks across the state. And the president of our bank is such a cool dude. He allows me, he knows when when I first started, I said, there's some things that I really don't want to give up. I don't want to give up, uh, like going to the fantasy camp. I don't want to give up going to golf events. He said, no, we'll give you a list of things that you need to, to do. Here's your goals. You hit your goals. I got no problem with any of that. And he's been wonderful for 24 years. It's just, uh, I love him to death. And our bank has grown from, we were about $500 million. We're now about $3.5 billion. So we've done a lot wow. of growth. Yeah. So it's been <laughs> I guess you have. Congratulations. And I, I mentioned you were a renaissance man. In 1981, you started singing country music songs at Cody's at Club 6th Avenue and 16th Street in Manhattan on Tuesdays and Wednesday nights. And then baseball goes on strike in 1981. And Doug Flynn starts touring with the Oak Ridge Boys, man. He's, he's, uh, he's singing on the tour with them. Do you still sing a little bit? Yeah, sing. We got a little group here that we get together on Friday nights and uh, there's three of us at Monday nights and Fridays and I sit in when I can. Uh, Greg Austin is my buddy's name and, and another friend named Mark Dennis. And we go sing a lot of old songs and just have fun and laugh. Uh, the deal with the Oak Ridge Boys, there's another thing that was a hair exaggerated laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I went on, uh, they were good friends. Johnny introduced me to me in the seventies. They were good friends. And they said, when we were on strike, would you like to go on the road? And I went, sure. I'd like to go out for a week. So I met with them. And one night we were somewhere and they said, we got a friend of ours. He just won a gold glove. He's a two time world series champion, blah, blah. Doug Flynn. So I stick my head out from around the corner and say, Hey, and they went, Oh no, no, come on out here. Huh? Uh oh. So I head out the stage and they said, we understand you've been dabbling in the music business. So wouldn't you all like to hear Doug sing a song? And I went, all right. <laughs> I said, uh, well, I know all the words to the Oak Ridge Boys song. And I said, which one are we going to do? They said, well, we're not going to do one of ours. We're not going to let you screw it up. We'll pick another one. <laughs> and they picked the song. <laughs> we started out and we did it. And then we did that for a couple of nights and had fun. Well, New York papers get a hold of it. Flynn touring with Oak Ridge Boys. Well, Great. all right, I'll, I'll go with it. What the heck? <laughs> yeah, that's 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 pretty phenomenal, though. I mean, you've had some unbelievable experiences, my man. It really it really is amazing how uh, you're so uh, you're so versatile. I mean, you can you can do so many things and do them well. Um, and then, of course, the broadcast part of it. You know, you've done great radio and TV work uh, with the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, Fox Sports Ohio, which is now, you know, Bally, um, obviously 700 WLW. So you enjoy that aspect, obviously. I did. You know, it was fun while it lasted. Uh, 
you know, I did the radio stuff with Marty, uh, would ask me to yep. come and do radio stuff with him. And that was yep. fun. We've known each other for so long. And, uh, and, and it was, it was wonderful getting that opportunity to work with, you know, maybe the best who ever sat down to call a ball game. Uh, that was fun. And then, you know, we had a little show that we do called Reds Weekly that, uh, Jeff Pecoro and I had fun doing and, yep. uh, that, that was good. Yeah. I enjoyed it. And it, it had a life of its own kind of, and, and uh, we started getting a little bit older and they started going a little bit younger. So, uh, you know, we may put an old man's show back together again. I don't know. That was, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> you still doing some uh, Kentucky Wildcats baseball on uh, the SEC network? At First Star Logistics, we're a very strict company that really puts the pressure on our employees. Brakes? What are those? That's what I'm talking about, Icky. Get the body right, then the mind's right. You know, yeah. you know you gotta get that body right. That's right. right. Yes, sir. <laughs> Become a star with a chance to earn the highest commission percentages in the industry as a freight broker agent. Check out FirstStarLogistics.com. Yeah, still doing that. I don't know how many years Dick Gabriel and I do it together. We're trying to figure out how many years we've done it. We can't remember. And I told him it was his job to remember because now that I'm 70, that's not my job anymore. So, uh, but that's fun. <laughs> that's fun. I love college baseball. Yeah. That's, uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Major League Baseball. What do you think about uh, the sticky stuff, you know, and, and how baseball has tried to eliminate the sticky stuff now and and it, uh, right away, it seems like the pitchers are having to make some adjustments. It seems like the hitters are having a little bit more success. What do you think? Well, uh, you know that old uh, saying, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. Uh, <laughs> pitchers forever have put something on the ball or had one of their fielders put something on the ball, it, whether it be yep. behind or, or whatever. You're always looking for an advantage. Hitters are looking for an advantage, trying to pick up signs. They got sticky stuff on the bat so they can use it. But, you know, I, I'm a little disappointed in the way our baseball is headed right now. I mean, just I, I couldn't even watch the All-Star game the other night because they came out in softball uniforms, and I just thought that was hideous. <laughs> yeah. no, I mean, you, you can't take a guy out at second base anymore. You can't pitch inside. Um, you're starting a runner at second base. It's like T-ball. If you go to extra innings, you start a runner on second with no out. And they say they got to save the arms of these pitchers. Well, maybe if they taught them how to pitch instead of how to throw. Uh, you ask a guy to go 100% for as long as he can. Well, shoot, I talk to a guy like Tom Browning or Tom Seaver. Man, they might be 70 or 80% to first or second inning until they had to reach back for a little bit. Today, you know, that's a lot of guys getting hurt. Look at the injuries the Reds have had. I mean, yep. they're, I like what Johnny said one time. He said, you know, we never had oblique injuries because, well, basically, we didn't have any obliques. That's for all these <laughs> <laughs> muscular and everything. And he said, we all have a little fat on us. And uh, he said, but we never got hurt. And uh, I, I just wish they'd think before all this stuff keeps going on with baseball. Like the DH, they want to make it probably mandatory uh, in the National League which right. takes away a lot of strategy of the, of the game. And I'm old school lap. And, you know, I think I'm probably about that close from being that guy that's going, get off my lot. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I just, what I you, love the, the baseball. It's, it's, it's worked pretty good for 150 years. Yeah. No question about that. What do you think about the shift? They're talking about taking the, eliminating the shift, you know, and, and uh, that, that's a huge change. I mean, it, should they go back to the traditional way of playing baseball defensively configuration wise and eliminate the shift? No, they've always shifted. You shifted up back in the old days. You shifted on Willie Stargell, Willie McCovey, uh, Dave Kingman. It, we always played a shift. Now they play it on every hitter. And I don't know right. how many times in the game and seen a, a routine ground ball go through a hole. It should have been a double play, but they've had to shift on. But, you know, I, I think, and, and the other argument that I would have for them, you mean to tell me that a hitter can adjust to a 98 or 100 mile an hour fastball and hit it out of the park? but he can't adjust hitting that ball to the opposite side of the field. I'm not buying that. So, you know, they, they can give you all the excuses and it, it's, you know, now they got so many names for stuff, launch angles and spin ratios and OP this and war and all that. I don't even shoot. I mean, you have to have a computer, the bottom line, and you will know this too. 
when you and I played, there was only one stat that mattered. And that was the one that you have, or two, I guess. Do you have the W or the L? Yep. I don't care how you get there. You win or you lose. That was the bottom line. Yep, yep. It seems like you mentioned launch angle. It seems like one through nine in the batting order now. That's all they care about is launch angle, going for the fences. I think, personally, it's easier to pitch to, to line yeah. these days. Everybody's just trying to – it's either a home run or strikeout. Everybody's trying to crank the heck out of the baseball. I mean, there's no – Pete Roses or guys like that that just are masterful hitters, you know. Everybody's just trying to get the big uh, the big knock. Yeah, there's no – especially with two strikes. You know, we were told you choke up, put the ball in play. If you put it in play, you got a chance. Not now. They, they've kind of eliminated that and had them going just don't change anything. Just keep swinging hard, and that's why there are so many strikeouts in the game today. But, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot different, and it's not I, – I love the close ball game because I knew that – that made uh, the balance of that game might be on a defensive play. And I love that part of it. But now they kind of speak out of both sides of the mouth. At one time they're saying the pitchers are too dominant. And then they were saying they got to juice the balls up. And then the offense is too dominant. Just let the game be, let it, it'll, it'll find itself out there. And then, and guys will adjust. Uh, but there's just a lot of goofy stuff going on with it now. And let's talk about, uh, the current Cincinnati Reds a little bit, Doug, and appreciate you carving the time you've carved for us. Uh, this this ball club is four games out of first place in the division, three and a half games out of a wild card position. Um, they had a you know a, a heck of a run, nine and two run before the the All Star break. What do you look for with the in the second half of this baseball season with the Reds? Well, probably just to see if they're going to stay healthy. I mean, you look what they've done, and they got Mike Moustakas hadn't played a bit. Uh, a lot of their pitchers have played. They're just now coming back because they, they've had injuries. Uh, they've been carried by two players for the most part, uh, and Cassianos and Jesse Winker, who have just had outstanding first half. Um, and then, but they're getting play by some of their extra guys. You know, they've had a blue million people play shortstop and second base, but they're all filling in quite nicely. And uh, I I really think Suarez is going to get hot at some point in time. I, I hope he does because he's just a I love the kid. You know he, he swings the bat good. He he he's everything you want in a football player. He handles the media good. He talks to the fans. I, I really hope that he gets hot. Now if you were to get him hot with the way the other guys are swinging the bat, you know it could be something special. Uh, the starting pitching's been fine. Bullpen has just really hurt him. I'm, I'm a big Tucker Barnhart fan. Uh, he, I just, he's a buddy, and I think he's great for the game. But then you bring in uh, Stevenson, who's a monster, and uh, yeah. he's playing very well. So, well, they, uh, they drafted the shortstop with their first, uh, first first round pick in the draft out of UCLA. I mean, yeah. uh, the three first round picks, they went shortstop, catcher, and center fielder. I mean, they, they went right the middle of the defense where you have to be strong, right? I mean, do you like, you like the way they handled their draft, the Reds? I don't know why you'd look for a catcher right now. I mean, unless you're assuming he's going to be four to five or six years away because you, you're solid at catching. I mean, you're solid. you got a two-time gold glover back there, Tucker, that's swinging the bat good this year. And then Stevenson, who's from the right side. Uh, so, uh, I like I say, I don't know. Maybe they're at times when it's your turn to draft, <clears throat> excuse me, what you're doing is you're just trying to get the best person available. And I remember when they drafted Jonathan India, they said they were looking for the best offensive player they thought they could get at that time. And now, now he's you know, solid at the top of the lineup for Cincinnati and playing a good second base. You know, and I don't know he's a gold glove caliber second baseman, but he's a good offensive player. And the more he plays, certainly he's going to get a lot better. And uh, this team seems to really like each other. They seem to have a, a lot of enthusiasm, which is something that's been missing from this team, I think, over the last couple of years. Final question, and again, thanks for spending all this time with us. You're awesome. I knew you would be. <laughs> fantasy Camp. You're basically the chairman of Fantasy Camp. How much fun has that been? Wow. Well, your buddy Anthony Munoz has been there, and Jim Breach has been there. Did you know yep. that? And, I did, uh, yep. They Are you ready to come down? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be pretty <laughs> ugly, Coach. That'd be pretty ugly. <laughs> You know, I've been doing it since I got out of the game. I got out in 86, spring of 86, and uh, then I went to the fantasy camp, and I've been doing them ever since, and I'm so thankful to the Hall of Fame. Uh, that's kind of who runs it now with Rick Walls and Aaron Chamberlain. And they've 
I, they made me commissioner, I guess, because I'm I used to be the one of the youngest one coming to camp, and played every inning of every game down there in the fa- in the pro game, and now we're trying to get some younger players, and I've sort of stepped back because I, as I'm coming up, as a matter of fact, this week uh, there's a golf tournament for all of our fantasy campers they're putting together on uh, Friday. Uh, so I'll come up Thursday night, meet with them, have dinner, play golf on Friday, and then head back down home. It's just the relationships we've made. The baseball is awesome, and that's what brought us all together. But I've met some of the most quality people that I've ever met in my life just through this fantasy camp. And, uh, yeah, it, it's a blast. And for people who are listening to the podcast that never, never been and you've wanted to go, jump on board because I promise you, you will not be disappointed. Yeah, I, everybody that I've talked to, Anthony couldn't say enough good things about it. Breach as well. I mean, they, the experience, they say, is just phenomenal. You guys do an unbelievable job, and uh, that, that's – I bet there's some sore bodies. How, how many how many trainers do you have down there taking care of all the muscles and everything? Uh, I think only eight or ten. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I hear man, that. After, after the lion, the first day, the lion is pretty small because guys are thinking, hey, I'm in better shape than I thought it was. Nice. After the second day, they're lined up down the hall. <laughs> Oh, I hear you. You come limping off an airplane and you're like, you can't move and you might have a bandaid on you. You may have scarred up a little bit and your family's going, oh my gosh, are you okay? <laughs> it's the best week of my life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a good pain. It's a good pain it's for good sure. Pain. That's right. <laughs> well, Doug, you're a heck of a man and you've had a heck of a life. There's no question about it. And uh appreciate you visiting with us on the podcast, sir. Hey, I'm a- fan of yours and a friend of yours and i love listening to you guys do the games all during the fall and the winter time and and uh it's always good to run into you so hopefully we'll be running each other a whole lot more hi dave lapham here have you heard about in the trenches with dave lapham presented by first star logistics catch new episodes from the world of sports and broadcasting search for in the trenches with dave lapham on youtube or wherever you get your podcasts